And we are live from around the world. I'm going to start off all the way on the right because she's coming from tomorrow. <laughs> Ellie Johnson, how are you doing? How do, how do things look? Is our we future do, we good? Do you want to know what's going to happen tomorrow? Because I can tell you because it's 9.39 a.m. in your tomorrow. So it's it's amazing. You just wait till you get here. It's, it's dynamic. <laughs> Fantastic. So the sun did come up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It came <laughs> up in the east and it's going to go down in the west. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, good, good. I, I, I want to make sure that it's certain that we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, Let me know when you get here, but I'll be further on. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, Ellie, you are the truth maven and a former police officer, and you essentially teach what? Well, what do you teach? Truth? Instead of, <laughs> I, I want to see, I want to go down that path because I, I kind of like that principle. We spend a lot of time focusing on lies, but really mm. kind of the truth is a more important baseline, I think. So that's exactly that, that, that sums up my journey. I think Eric around focusing on deception for a long time and then understanding how um, pivotal, how integral truth is in everything that we do not just truth as in right or wrong or true or false, but a much more complex and broad and deeper uh, application of truth. So for the last couple of years, I've been creating models around that to really understand the impact of truth or the impact of lack of truth across every single part of our, our life, our personal life, our relationships, our, our working life, everything. So I focus less these days on detecting deception and more on attracting truth and encouraging truth and influencing truth and understanding truth. So that's kind of my world right now. On that note, then, true is also a direction. Is that what you mean? Like when you shoot an arrow, its path is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that also Why tied not? in with what you're doing? Sure, you, you could you could align that. I think when when I started to go down that rubber, rabbit hole to understand the impact of truth and look at the different definitions and how people use the word, uh, it, it, the rabbit hole was very deep. And so you can bring in lots of different phrases and words and analogies and metaphors around it. And I'm still look. The deeper I go down the rabbit hole, the more um, interesting the topic gets so i'm i'm learning things all the time but i i know how i'm implementing these lessons into my life and into my relationships and into my success and into my parenting and all of those things and how i want to help people i i guess i see truth as a superpower so when you know how to really use it, it it's almost like a secret weapon to get more success in in life but yeah it's it's big it's complex Okay, so now we're going to jump to Lena. Now, Lena is a former military interrogator, spent a lot of time in Gitmo, mm -hmm. um, Camp X-Ray, right? Actually, uh, it was Camp Delta. So I landed the day that all the detainees were going from Camp X-Ray to Camp Delta. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Probably had to expand everything a bit. I mean, Camp oh, yeah. X-Ray, when I was there in the 90s, um, I think I talked about it before, but that was literally chain link fences and... Yeah. and um, razor wire all around mm -hmm. the top. And I was there for the Cuban refugees mm -hmm. and camp wow. X-ray was a special place. All the other camps were like little mini cities, like tent cities. Wow. And X-ray was, Oh, we know you, you were exiled. You murdered somebody. You robbed yeah. somebody. So, uh, we got yeah. a place for you. Yeah, yeah. Come on over here. And <laughs> that's where the um, people who are, shall we say, kind of caught in the you. middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were they the high value? No, they were criminals. I mean, well, this is all I mean. pre 9 11. So it's kind of, it's so weird to me because I was there and you know, I'm old. Okay. I was there before uh -huh. 9 11 happened. Yeah. I was there during the Clinton years when um, about 100,000 plus Cuban refugees just yeah, remember mm -hmm. they left and then they were like, uh, yeah, what do we do? And so mm -hmm. they put them all in Gitmo and then Haiti. The invasion happened at the same time, so we also had a Haitian camp. There was yes. about twenty to thirty thousand Haitians. Yeah. So that yeah. was Gitmo. That was now, Gitmo. You now we're going to have fun with this because I know you have a great time dis discovering liars. Yes, so I do. We're going to talk about the uh, other end of that, which is um, 
I think you would agree that, well, we all lie. And oh, that it was does. social lubricant. Yeah, every human. And we all don't lie for malicious reasons. Some of us lie because we just want to make other people feel good or we're too embarrassed about something, but we all lie. I am curious for both of you, and I like taking things down different tracks, but um, what about lying for sport? And I, I'm, I'm just saying there, there are people out there who literally, mm -hmm. they just <laughs> lie for giggles. Like, oh, it's the biggest fish. Oh, it's that. It's, or, or whatever. And, and it's almost like they're toying with you all the time. Like, oh, yeah, I went there once. Did you really? No. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes people will lie and you're thinking, what is the benefit? Like I get it, ego, right? People with huge sure. egos, narcissistic tendencies, they lie because it just makes themselves feel better and they want to put themselves above everybody. But if there's no benefit, I'm always scratching my head thinking, why? Why do it? You know, what's the outcome? I think there's always a benefit though, isn't there? There's there's a benefit that we might not be able to understand, but there's if mm -hmm. people get to their goal by using truth in most cases they would in my view truth is easier right. truth feels comfortable truth fits with most people's values but mm -hmm. when, when truth gets in the way of somebody's goals or somebody's um desire or somebody's motivation then that's when deception comes in mm -hmm. um otherwise i think most of the time people are truthful but when truth gets in the way that's when deception kicks in Oh yeah, especially for saving, uh, I say saving face, right? Like in relationships, mm -hmm. truth will get in the way when you don't want to admit to something that's um, going to embarrass you, that's gonna get you in trouble, that's gonna cause an argument that could ruin your relationship or your marriage. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Well, and, and that and that reminds me of a quote uh, from an earlier interview that um, Ellie did that lying has two basic motives, which is, uh, I believe you said, make a gain or avoid a pain. Avoid a pain. Yeah, I mean, that's a simplified version of it too. You could break down lots of different mo motivations that somebody might might be driven by to be deceptive. But really, it's like anything we do in life. It's to make a gain or avoid a pain. It, it, like, think about all the things, whether you got up this morning and went went for a run or, or you know, what, what's the gain, what's the pain, and how do you balance these up against each other? So, yeah. Now, Lena, and, you know, I, I, I like dwelling on it just because it's interesting. You've brought up, though, that there's almost like four points to lying. There's either lying to make oneself look better, seem better, mm -hmm. lying to protect somebody else, Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, I, I, oh, it wasn't, you know, my spouse who drove that car, DUI, it was me, I drove it, you know, it, which is a, mm -hmm. not necessarily an evil intention. It's kind mm -hmm. of trying to protect somebody, um, lying to, you know, just compliment or, you know, feelings. And then there's lying to harm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go into that? The, did I get them right first off? And do you want to go into that? All right. So I'm going to be honest and not lie to you right now. I don't remember that. <laughs> so it, I'm like, well, it sounds good. I like it. I don't remember it. I, I know I, I'm like, I can write that down. I'll go back and listen to that. You did. It's in your book. <laughs> I, I was like, got to be in my book. You must read this. So let me find that. Let me find that. Yeah, can you find that reference actually? <laughs> so <laughs> I am so used to teaching the four types of lies now that, um, I, gosh, I haven't even mentioned that. And of course, I just got done training law enforcement. So it's in my head. So I like what I wrote. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree with it. <laughs> I don't remember, but I like it. <laughs> okay. Well, Fine. And I want to get into a little bit of history. Ellie, we don't know you very well. You were you were a cop. Can you take us on a little bit of a journey? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like a thousand years ago and um, it's like a past life. But I graduated from the Victoria Police Academy in Australia, in Melbourne, on the 13th of May, won't say the year, and it was my 22nd birthday. So I actually graduated on my 22nd birthday. But it was Friday uh, the 13th. Friday the 13th, yes. <laughs> I was born on Friday the 13th too, so I don't know what all that means. Oh. Depends if you're superstitious. And so it was only an 18-week course back then. Now, I don't know, different, different states, different countries have different training durations. Now, 
for a 21 year old to be trained for 18 weeks and then be sent out to the streets of Melbourne and be told, there you go, you know what to do. At the time it seemed about right, but when I look back on it, I think, what the, 18 weeks? And a lot of that we were just running around a running track or it, it, there's so much that I didn't know. But at that age and at that stage, I thought I knew most of what I needed to know. So I had a gun, I had handcuffs, I had a baton. You know, what else do you need? And so they sent us out to the streets of Melbourne the following week and we learned how to, to direct traffic, which was, you know, pretty amazing. <laughs> Not, And then it was my first my first real job, which was a suspected shoplifter in a major department store. And my partner, who'd also just graduated, partner and I went to that, that job. We were feeling like we could save the world. We had our shiny uniform and our shiny badge and our gun and our everything. And we were going to go and arrest somebody and put them in jail for shoplifting. It was big. And it was right then at the back of that, that department store when I was faced with this man that I thought was quite old at the time. When I look back, he was probably about 40. But at 22, 40 seems like, oh, my God, I'm going to interview this old man. So yes, this is <laughs> in both, right? <laughs> yes, that's right, because we're still only 24. And um, so it was actually that was my first aha moment when I I realised that this whole policing thing and the human behaviour and eliciting information and questions and detecting deception, everything perhaps was not as simple as it, uh, as I thought it might be because here was a person that was accused of something and how do I get him to give me information that is against his own self-interest? Uh, how, why would he say he stole the jacket if he has, doesn't have to, if there's no TV, CCTV or other evidence? Why? How would I do that? How would I get somebody to give me information against their own self-interest. And I didn't know the answer at that stage. So he kept on saying, I didn't take it, I didn't take it, I didn't take it, I didn't take it. And we kind of ran out of questions quickly going, yes, you did, tell us you did. <laughs> and so it was kind of from that point that I said, I need a whole lot more information. I need to, to sit in on other people's interviews. I need to read more, I need to research more. They did not teach us enough mm about question formulation, about influencing people to be more truthful, about uh, detecting behaviours associated with deception. So that's kind of how that journey started. And here I am today still still learning, still growing, still, um, yeah. So I'm going to jump doesn't... to Lena on that because one thing that really stands out in my mind, and I can't confirm it here, I have my theories of what we do in the States, but I can't confirm. Lena, you train police. Yes. Is that normal to put two new recruits as partners on the street? Isn't it more typical to put the new recruit with somebody who's got a couple of few years under their belt, at least for a while? Yes, the latter is typical. But I will also say what's typical is that you, I train law enforcement personnel who have 10, 15 years, they're detectives, they're investigating all types of crimes, and they've never had one formal interviewing course. Same. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, good. So now we can go back to Ellie. <laughs> well, no, you, you didn't have the I, I, I agree. I agree with Lena. Like, I, I, I do training for our nation's security and intelligence uh, agency here, ASIO. And I remember 10, 15 years ago, the first time I stood in front of them to train them in my perceptive interviewing program. And I actually thought I was out of my depth. I thought, what am I doing here? These, these are our nation's intelligence geniuses. And here's little old me. I had some imposter syndrome going on. Uh, yes, I like my course. Yes, there's a lot gone into it. Uh, yes, it's worked in other areas. But these guys are going to eat me alive. They're going to go, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happened. It was a four-day program. And they raved about the course. They said it was the most practical training that they've done. It was the most helpful. Uh, yes, there was refresher elements, but there was new stuff too. There was thought provoking, all of that. And and I went on to have, you know, train every, uh, the, all the people in there about four times a year. So it um, it's amazing how many people do not mm -hmm. train enough in the core skill and area that they work in across how across. How did you learn? is where I wanted to go with it though, because you, you said, hey, you didn't have the tools. So I'm very yeah. curious because you had to get the tools somehow. Mm -hmm. How did you go about getting the tools? What what did you do? 
Yeah, so that, that took a while. And still, I've got heaps to learn. You don't stop learning. You don't get to a point and go, yeah, I know everything because I, I don't. I'm learning every day with every book I read and every podcast I listen to. But back then, I after that experience on that first week out of the academy, I made it my business to sit in on as many interviews as I could. So I, uh, I wanted to be around good interviewers and bad interviewers and um, all types of cases and crimes. And wherever I could, I was there going, can I sit in? Can I sit in? Can I sit in? How, how would and, you differentiate? And I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm just curious. Right. Like you said, but you're good interviews and bad interviews. Did you have anybody that you found who could kind of help guide you and say, hey, Bill Smith here? He's, he's a good good guy, good family man, but he doesn't do a good job here. Yeah, so you know, just kind of be careful. Watch out for, for what's going on in this. Or is that something you absorbed over time? A bit of a bit of all of it. So some of it you figure out yourself, and some I did have some good uh, sergeants that were mentors that realized that I was really proactive and they took me under their wing and said, Okay, okay, let me teach you what I know and let me teach you what I think works based on my experience. Mm -hmm. And and I did see some interesting some interesting techniques and i remember um one of the te sure. techniques it was it was a good, good cop bad cop technique yeah. and they didn't teach us that in the in the academy and i'll try and make the story story short but we uh so i was still quite junior and i was at a different station now and there was two senior constables that were going out to to speak to this woman she was a, a street work a sex worker prostitute and she had information in relation to this big drug deal that was going down and she they needed to get that it was very time sensitive so there was urgency there and they said to me come along uh, you can't do the interview but you can watch and and learn and so we we drove down to where she was sure enough she was standing on the street she was a young lady and she did not like police so her response as the police car pulled up was kind of, I can't say the words on this <laughs> on this uh, yeah, conversation, on. <laughs> but it had Fs and it had Cs and it had everything in it. So oh. she, did, she did not want to talk to us. She did not want to help. She ended up coming back to the police station. As she was told to get into the car. I don't know what they said to get her in the car. And then I watched at the police station this interview. I sat in the corner like a good little junior rookie and the, I watched this good cop, bad cop, thing go on I'm like oh my god I thought this just happens on TV and and so you know good cop will come along and say um her, her name is Crystal here, here Crystal here's a glass of water and um you know it's okay we just want to talk to you and blah, blah, blah. then he'd walk away bad cop would come along and go if you don't fucking tell us what and I'm like, <laughs> oh. so this kind of went on for a while like is this gonna work is this like you know and she just closed up she was blocked she was closed up mm -hmm. she she was she did not want to talk the more they did this thing the more she closed up she just had this look mm -hmm. of hatred mm -hmm. oozing from her body mm -hmm. And so I don't know what time passed, but whilst that was happening, I was looking at her prior convictions for a young lady. She had quite a few drug and, and, and mm -hmm. um, burglary and stuff. And I found something that I thought was interesting. And so when the guys had finished and they said, come on, let's take her back to the street. She's not going to tell us anything. I said, do you mind if I talk to her? Now, I my little mm -hmm. heart was racing. Come on, oh, this is too scary for me. But they, they said, <laughs> yeah, as if she, she hasn't told Hope us anything. Let me try. Mm. Yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah, as if she's going to tell you anything. I'm like, okay, okay. So I went over with my little piece of paper and she's walked, I walked to her and she's like, what do you effing want? I'm like, no, 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 nothing, no, no. And I sat quietly with her and they were on the other side of the room. It was quite a big room. So they couldn't hear us. And I said, do you know, I was, I was listening and watching and watching these guys give you a hard time. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but I, I did find something when I was reading a, a bit about your background, something that I thought was really interesting. Now, she's listening and she's leaning forward a little bit. So mm -hmm. I figured out probably in hindsight, I looked back on that and realised, okay, we've got that, that rapport, that connection, at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so she was curious and she said, what, what? And I said, do you know that you and I have exactly the same date of birth? She goes, no effing way. And I said, yes, effing way. And I pulled out my police ID and my, my you know, ID and with my date of birth. And she goes, oh, shit, that's, that's frigging amazing. And so she, could have quite, she could have quite easily said, so what? But she, she actually kind of thought that was, that was kind of freaky. We were, exact, we were both 22, mm -hmm. born on the 13th of May. 
Wow. And she let her guard down and it was like it was just this this whole everything about her changed. It was here was now two 22 year old women connecting. Mm -hmm. And and I said, isn't it weird where life takes you? Like, you know, here you are in this room being hassled by these guys. Here I am sitting in this really uncomfortable, stupid blue uniform with this little tie that is so stupid and impractical. And she laughed. So we just connected. We leant forward. We talked. They couldn't hear us. And I said to her, do you even know the answer to the questions that these guys have been asking you? Like, do you know the name of the, the guy that we need? She goes, yeah. And I said, oh, cool. W will you tell me it? She goes, yeah. <laughs> so she got a piece of paper. She wrote down everything we needed to know. So I got a piece of, talked a bit more with her, walked over, gave the piece of paper to the guys. <laughs> but that doesn't make me an expert interviewer but no. what, it, what it did do was again another aha moment saying okay whatever I did just then it worked a treat how do I do that again how do I replicate that what was that um, so I went on to understand people like people that are like them if you build rapport you can get and Lena talks a lot about this and can expand was that your this. first breakthrough I'm curious um for that particular bit of awareness, yes. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, okay. in earlier years, you kind of get the hang of it on a, you know, on a date or in a relationship, you know, you, sure. you have rapport. But in that context for that type of, it's not as high stake as some of the interviews that Lena's done, but it was still really important it's at the time. pretty context. similar though, isn't mm -hmm. it, Lena? It is very similar, very. And I'm curious, and I'm going to jump to Lena for a second. Um, I think probably the most important thing is that you showed her interest. I mean, you were actually curious enough to bother to even look at her birth date and then mm -hmm. to find any kind of commonality. It could have been, oh, you have a daughter. I have a daughter or you know, whatever. It could be a, a, a million possible things of just if, if you can't be interesting yourself is the old joke. Be interested. Mm -hmm. Say, yes. I'm boring. I'm interested in my guess. Mm -hmm. it, it's in that style. So, Lena, you had similar circumstances i'm guessing with detainees oh yeah only you know a little bit further apart culturally speaking but mm -hmm. still if you showed interest in them oh definitely um it's like what ellie says so i have a motto and i learned it within two to three weeks at gitmo because i tried all the approach techniques that i was taught in my school and the fear up and the pride and ego down and the um futility it just didn't work because you're dealing with a human it, regardless of what they've done you're dealing with a human and you attract more bees with honey than vinegar so i tell people in all my classes you're not going to get the truth unless that person wants to give it to you so when I'm interviewing or just even having a conversation, I'm trying to dig way down to the levels to discover the motivations that are going to make you trust me, like me, like exploiting the similar to me bias, having that connection so that you warm up to me and say, you know what? Yeah, I like you. I'm going to give you the truth. And it's so easy because you can find common ground with any human being on this planet. You just mm -hmm. have to figure out and have a conversation with them. And just like what you said, Eric, be interested in them, but also be interesting because people, if they're interested in you, they're going to listen to you. They're going to be inquisitive. They're going to want to hear what you have to say. And then finally, I always try to be confident, right? I always portray confidence because confidence attracts people. When you're confident, people want to be around you. They want to listen to you. When you're arrogant, nobody wants to deal with you and nobody wants to be around you. And when you're rude or accusatory, you're done. They're going to just shut up and put the guard up or shut down and put the guard up. Okay. So you ran through a few um, false starts though before that happened. Oh, it wasn't yeah. like instant. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I thought I got trained these techniques, so they have to work. Good cop, bad cop, and fear up. They got to work, right? Why would I be trained them if they didn't? And the first time I tried fear up, the interrogation lasted for about two hours, and I didn't do anything but try to say, Don't what, what is fear up? Can, can you? I'm sorry, I've never yeah. heard that. So, fear up is creating a fear in somebody, it is not, you know, throwing things around. Now, it could be, but I wasn't crossing that line because I have a moral and ethical compass every time I'd go into an er uh, interrogation or an interview sure. that I would never cross just as a human. Um, but fear up is instilling fear in somebody. I'm going to make you so scared that you're going to confess to me. 
That does not work <laughs> because if I make you that scared, you're just going to want to get away from me or you're going to go want to find somebody else to come help you in your situation. Because you're going to lie to give you whatever you want so you'll go away. Exactly. Kind of like torture. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, both of you, and I don't know if you've seen it, Ellie. Um, one of my favorite videos on the internet in terms of interrogation, questioning, or anything else is Russell Williams. I don't know if you guys yeah. have seen that. He no. is a serial killer in Canada, a colonel in the uh, Canadian Air Force. He was so important that I believe he flew the Queen oh. at one point. So he was very, very high up, had SEER training. So, you know, uh, yeah. I don't remember, survival, evasion, et cetera. It's a military training. And the detective literally did everything right. I mean, in terms of just talking to him, he never got mad with them. He was very um, phlegmatic, I guess you would say would be the term. Just how you doing? Respectful, things like that. So I, I just wanted to compare. But if you guys haven't seen it, well, you really should see it. It's it's yeah, masterful, especially because at the end of it, I mean, it, it is just almost shocking because all this back and forth and talking and everything is like, well, Russell, can you can you just tell us, you know, tell me where where the body is and he said you have a map <laughs> yeah. and that was the end yeah and that was the end it was like whoa you know what I mean? yeah. it was just mind-blowing the you know the turning and yeah. everything else because the guy was smug and you know powerful yeah. and, and the cop just is perfect I hate to stereotype but why not he was like uh, it was this perfect canadian nice <laughs> to him. So just you know <laughs> the stereotype but yeah. people have been deceptive. Like there's kind of, I, I think, Lena, and what do you think about this? There's, I think there's mainly two reasons that they will confess, and, mm -hmm. and that's because the the weight of that deception yeah. is no longer bearable. They, they, it just doesn't, they can't handle that weight. They can't handle the stress. They can't handle the whole situation. And the other reason is that they believe that the evidence is so overwhelmingly against them that the yes. truth will come out any, anyway. So... You know, in that case, and I haven't seen that, but I do actually do remember one of my students telling me to watch that, Eric. So now that's two people, so I better watch it. But yeah. in that case, probably both of those were occurring for him. The weight of that deception, he, all sorts of clashes. If he had high, high ethical and moral values, and and he's he's made a choice in life that's turned out, you know, a certain way. So he's got mm -hmm. all that going on, and then. He knows that there's all sorts of potential evidence that's out, out there. So he could have a bit of both of those going on. And yeah. at some point, it actually feels good to tell the truth. It, yes. it, it, it takes that uh, that weight off because carrying mm -hmm. carrying a decep deception around is is pretty hard for most people. Mm -hmm. And, it, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for every lie you tell, you've got to come up with another one and then you get tangled in this deceptive web and, yeah. That's not fun. Is that, is that what you do, Ellie? I'm, I'm just curious about that. Is, is it, um, and I'm saying gently, but when you're questioning somebody, do you just very calmly let them answer the story and then go on and then do a Columbo on them? Uh, we have a show here <laughs> called Columbo, Old in the Days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, one more thing, uh, you know, like let them yeah. say something and then kind of go, oh, wait, so did you get your gas first or did you do such and such? And then they go on and just kind of gently just keep doing it to where their mind gets exhausted when they have more and more and more complexity. For sure, you can do that. And the other thing that I think you need to keep in mind in any sort of interaction, whether that's a high stake interview or um, any interaction where truth is important is think about making it safe for somebody to tell you the truth from the start. So creating a truth telling environment. And because once somebody does lie, they're now they've made that choice and they're there in in that place that they they lied so it's kind of a hard place what do i do i don't just jump out and go actually that was a lie it it, it they, they got to go back that up now like oh god i've got to back it up got to back it up and so mm -hmm. a lot of interviewers or just people in in general in life we we kind of trap people into the lie even on a date or in your relationship you don't make it safe for somebody to come and tell mm -hmm. you the truth they might start telling you the truth but they realize uh oh um, it's going to be safer for me to lie. So they go back into that place of, yeah. of deception. Um, so that's that's a really big thing for people to think about in day-to-day -day life, in, in sales, in um, the relationships, to think, do I actually make it safe for people to be truthful with me yeah. or not? And it's a big question. Mm. Don't think that's a question. That's a massive question and it takes 
a lot of work to answer it and then to do something about it. And it's crazy to hear you say that, Ellie, because you know, Ellie and I met, what, two years ago? I mm. think two years. And we have we teach the same things. We have the same um not terminology, that's changed, right? So you just called it a truth environment. Do you know what I train all my law enforcement? You have to create a safe environment for them to tell the truth. I'm constantly saying that to them. And they're like, well, what is that? I'm like, be, they have to feel relaxed. They have to feel comfortable. They have. They can't fear repercussions. They can't fear you know anything. They have to be able to want to tell the truth and feel good about it. So what does that safe environment look? And sometimes it changes per person, which is why it's so critical that you have to get to know the person that you're talking to. And even in relationships, right? Do you or have you in the past reacted one way every time your partner brings up this sensitive subject? Well, now you've conditioned your partner to say, oh, I'm not doing that again. And instead, I'm going to avoid it and I'll lie or I'll do something else because that's easier and I feel safer that way. Well, I'm so, curious, Lena, uh, on your end too, because you had detainees mm -hmm. and depending on the situation, I mean, I remember post 9-11, a lot of it is x-ray was kind of, or no, sorry, I get most kind of a black hole. Like mm -hmm. there was questions whether they'd even face a trial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're there. And as far as they're concerned, they're there. I mean, yeah, sure. and, and it, you know, till the end of time, until you know, they pass away, or whatever. Yeah. And that had to be a challenge for you to motivate them to bother telling you anything, because what are you yes. going to do about it? So this is what I was up against. Number one, they had a predisposition of hate towards me, just because mm -hmm. I was the enemy. I was the American. So they already came in hating me. Number two, they were going there and there was no help, not even hope. There was no answer. Nobody knew what was going on or what was going to happen. So it wasn't even like, oh, I can hope to get out because at that point, nobody was going anywhere because nobody knew what to do. Like you're there for eternity. And then number three, the majority of them wanted to die there. Because once they did, it would send this big mess. And this isn't me, Lena Cisco, making this up. This is what my detainees told me. They sure. told me, they're like, we don't want to talk to you. We don't have to cooperate you. And you know what? We're going to try to commit suicide here because once we do, we're going to be a martyr. And then actually people are going to revere us, right? And we'll kind of be the heroes. So we don't even care. So those three things also, that I had there's to another up, benefit too. The more of them that die there, the more likely Amnesty International and the international mm. forces start to look yeah. into the United States too. So they're yeah. going to embarrass us. Sorry, I just wanted yeah, to- Yeah, that no, that's there. true. And we spent so much time, so much time um, trying to stop suicide attempts. Oh my gosh, it was it was probably half the time doing that and then half the time you know, collecting intelligence information, um, stopping riots. They were all the time around the clock. But yeah, so it, it was hard because yet I still had to go into an interrogation booth, get this person to like me and give me information. But guess what? I did. And when it first. That's my question, how? Yeah, how I did. did you get them to cross that? I will tell you. There's... I will tell you. Because even through your predisposed hate, your fact that you want to die there, uh, life is pretty much over, blah, 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 blah. Guess what? I was a human being sitting across from you and you still mm. were interested enough in me. And interested enough to say, who are you? What do you want? You may have not told me the information yet or were honest and truthful, but you're like, all right, what's what's this session going to bring? Maybe I can get something out of it. I am getting a little bored in my cell. Who is this girl? You know, maybe I will have a conversation with her. And so I said, hey, let's have a conversation. I don't care what it's about. But if I can get you talking and I can get you to know me, I can get you to like me. And that's how I started doing it. And I also tell people when I talk to them, I'm like, listen, I'm not here to judge you. I don't care what you did. Now, I do, but I'm not your judge and jury. I want the information, though. I expect mm -hmm. respect and honesty, and I'm in turn going to give that to you, but I need the information. Okay, Ellie, do you have, here in the States, we have Miranda rights. You know, mm -hmm. the old, uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. Yeah, yeah. Do you yes. have a similar thing in yes. Australia? Yes. Okay. I never want to presume anything. That's why I always want to ask. <laughs> yeah, so, pretty much the same. Pretty much the same. But it, here, it, it may have changed a little bit. It's a long time since I was in the police force, so, but it's pretty much the same. Okay. Well, here, anybody, and I would recommend to any friend I have, if you're arrested, you're talking to the cop, anything, say, my name is, I want a lawyer. 
I, I really <laughs> recommend that. So, honestly, from to anybody I know that, and if I ever get picked up, that is my my name is I want a lawyer. That, that's the only thing done that. Something bad, or if you haven't done something bad, I don't care. It, okay. it is the, it, it, it no. There's just so much here that it, you. If you don't know what's going on, you want a lawyer because yeah. it could be anything. You could be caught up. You could have been the wrong place at the wrong time. You could look like somebody. Who knows? But it does not. Um, it does not help you to be cooperative. But it darn sure can harm you. It's, and it'll it never harm you for asking for a lawyer. It's a shame that it's like that, isn't it? It's it's very, very sad that that is how things are. Yeah, and I agree. A lot of it shouldn't. No. You know, a, tr a truthful person, a, an honest person, a, um, someone that's done nothing wrong should be able to say it wasn't me and have a fair investigation trial, whatever the case is. Sure. And we, we all know that there's people in prison that shouldn't be there that mm -hmm. did not do anything wrong and they're they're in there yeah that's so where i'm going with it though i didn't mean to go down that path but how do you as a cop or how did you as a cop and by the way am i being wrong do i did you say cops in australia <laughs> yes. okay. cops I, pigs I, whatever. Well, <laughs> right, we're not gonna go there right? that's a sling everywhere <laughs> um how, how did you prevent people or or keep them talking and not saying F off, I want a lawyer. Oh, look, some people do say that. But the, the culture, I guess, in, in Australia is probably less like that. I, I just I can't give you evidence to, to prove that. But in my experience, uh, more people would talk. They're, less people would Oh, they do come it here. Out. They talk all the time here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. I, I, I didn't experience a lot of people go, I, I want a lawyer just because I, I was talking to them about that particular um, event whether they were deceptive or truthful um, it wasn't that that common to be honest um, yeah hmm. okay and I uh, and sorry to throw it out there I mean Lena what would you do uh, regarding what if you were picked up for whatever reason in any way what would I do yeah. I, I'm a talker I'm a communicator so I, <laughs> I talk I would she talk a way out of it <laughs> she can hide. Hide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't know. This is what I would do. Eric, just something sprung into my head that I haven't thought about for years. And this is actually a deceptive or a, a manipulative side of me. I remember after I left the police force, I, I worked in sales for a while and I was selling little match box cars. Oh, I've got feedback here. I don't know why. And I was selling matchbox cars. I was a sales rep and I had a, a, a car boot full of all these matchbox cars that I was taking up to this particular customer. And I got pulled over for speeding. And um, so the, the officer pulled me over and I got talking to him and realised that he had a couple of young boys <laughs> around four and five. And I started talking about my the matchbox cars and, and that I was a rep for that. And he goes, oh, really? I said, yeah, there's some new ones that have come out. And I showed him my my bootload and and yeah anyway i got off i got off i didn't need to ask for a lawyer i actually gave him some matchbox cars and i was set free from the speeding fine so i don't know what that is, but it just sprung into my head well that's uh, awesome now we've talked about um a controlled environment to recognize i well actually we're just talking about interrogation or i, I like to say conversation mm -hmm. because i'm thinking that interrogation itself is a loaded term yeah that uh you know versus an interview mm -hmm. if you're doing an interview hopefully you'll extract the knowledge that you need or share the knowledge or, or whatever else in it if that's the mindset it's probably less accusatory mm -hmm. how do you recommend and you guys have a course coming up but in life um you're both you know two very attractive females in, in the dating world things like that mm -hmm. and people are obviously concerned about safety so starting with lena um uh, what do you do when you're meeting people? And it could be friends, it could be day, it could be otherwise. To to know that, hey, I'm with somebody who's okay. Uh, well, it all depends. Are you meeting someone for the very first time? Like you've met them yeah. online and you've had a couple of text conversations or whatever, and now you're meeting them in person. You have to protect yourself. You have to go to public places. You've got to make sure there's people around. You have got to make sure that you are putting yourself in a physical environment that is safe for you. That's number one. 
because you have no idea who this person is. Absolutely no idea. And you still, if you're meeting them and they come across as great and they look really good, you still don't know who they are. They have a profile and sometimes that profile is just a representative or they're writing to attract a certain person and it may have nothing to do with who they really are. And so when you get to meet this person, now your spidey senses have to go up. You need to be able to come up and ask some formulated questions like Ellie and I ask, right? To really get to the heart of who people are. You need to be able to read body language. You have to be able to pick up on any indicators of truth and honesty, mm -hmm. but also deception. And if your stomach, if you have no training in interviewing and uh, questions to ask or detecting deception or detecting truth, but your stomach is like, oh, I, I don't know. There's something wrong. Then there's something wrong, right? I like to tell people if it looks and sounds like a duck, it's a duck, right? If your stomach is saying there's something wrong with this person, there is something wrong and back off and go away. Politely excuse yourself and the date, whatever, but always create a safe environment for you. And you have to vet people. You got to vet them before you let them get into your personal space and know too many personal details about you. Interesting point. You had mentioned about interests and things like that. And I'm going to go to Ellie on this. When you're meeting the person, can you maybe accomplish two things at once? Like, for example, if they say for, you know, in their profile that they just love animals or are fascinated by something that, that maybe you could meet them for a date at the zoo mm -hmm. or or somewhere that would resemble in a way what they've represented themselves being. Mm -hmm. And then if they are just you know fascinated with everything and halfway ignoring you, well, that's true. They do love the zoo. Or if they act a little sketchy around, you almost are like, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I thought that they really loved this. This doesn't register. There's so much to this answer. We could talk for hours about this, but you, I think we, <laughs> when we talk about dating, I think we also need to think about what are there. Were, there's lots of lies out there. What are the lies that matter? Do you want somebody to be completely truthful? If, if you wrote a profile, somebody wrote a profile that was completely truthful. Okay, I've had three marriages. Um, they've all turned into a disaster. My kids are a nightmare, and I never sleep at night. And I, I drink too much wine, and I blah blah. You know, if you put all the truth out there, it's not going to attract somebody. So we are we're picking the bits of us that we want somebody to know and we're also picking some things that other people might think that is pretty cool so we have to just kind of work out what are those what are those lies that we all tell and are they high stack lies or are they don't really mm -hmm. don't really matter so yes you could go to the, the zoo and you could test it that way um but we're, we're we're i think we need to allow somebody to um backtrack on some of the things that they've said too because you may have put some lies in your profile they may have put some lies in their profile so we don't necessarily want to catch them out on every lie um right mm -hmm. up because that's just human behavior but we need to work out uh, is there information in there or what comes out of their mouth next that is red flag that we need to to worry about and and um can i tell you a quick story eric that back yes. in the police force too and and again I, I sort of see things as my aha moment that steer me in a particular direction and this was the first job that i'd been to that really sort of shook me and and it's it's kind of a bit bit nasty but it was i was on night shift and we got called to this job and we it was the woman's flatmate that had called the police and she said i've just come home there's blood everywhere um there's blood going upstairs and i, I don't know what to do and i don't know where my flatmate is and um and so we we got there at the same time that the the ambulance got there and walked inside and the flatmate was out the front hysterical like oh i don't know what's happening and the carpet was white but covered in red blood so it was kind of this Whoa, oh my god and we walked up the stairs there's blood all the way up the stairs and the ambulance officers were actually walking ahead of the, the two police officers don't know why but it was got into this into the bedroom and this woman was laying on her bed just she'd been bashed there was blood everywhere it was just dis mm. disgusting she was alive and and I, I was, again, in shock. It was the first time I'd seen, experienced something like that. And I remember clearly the one of the ambulance officers said, hmm, looks like she trusted the wrong guy. And I'm like, oh. Like, it just it stuck out so clearly because it, it didn't make sense in my head. To me, it should have been, oh, my God, let's let's fix her up. Like, oh, what, like, is it, the 
they were still fixing her up. They were, were still tending to her. But they had seen so many of these things that they didn't have that like, ugh. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, he'd already calculated, all right, it was some, it's not a break-in. She's let someone in the house and this has happened. And, and I couldn't kind of make, make sense of it and what does that mean? But I, I think that that triggered me at that point to do more in this space and do more. I've got two daughters. I want them to be safe dating. I want them to be safe with, with everyone in their, their life. And um, mm -hmm. so I think my journey to this point and the, the work that Lena and I are, are embarking on together is it fits beautifully with everything mm -hmm. that I've experienced over the years. It's all coming together in this beautiful, perfect storm. Sorry. It is. I, I'm it sorry, is. I haven't. Uh, somebody who oh, yeah. is oh. half the butt in. It's a <laughs> oh. If I don't get him, you'll be hearing him in the background. Oh. Well, my three are locked out of the room. They're scratching at the door right now. Well, this won't be beating on the door if I. <laughs> so. I'm going to take it down. All right, so. oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, that. And that's kind of where I wanted to go with this is what signs do you look for? And, and you know, with Lena, you're right, Ellie, obviously everybody's going to lie or, you know, pad the resume slightly because they don't want to say all that. But ironically, as soon as you said that though, about um, being completely truthful with everything, there's a movie called the, the big short and it's based on a book and the guy met his wife. And he essentially said, I'm, you know, I'm this age, I'm physically out of shape. I have a hundred thousand dollars in student debt and I'm wrecked or whatever. And she's like, oh, you're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, he was so uh, dead on honest. So I was like, that's great. And you never the know. Truth can be refreshing. The truth can be refreshing. But, and we all want the truth. We all say we want the truth from politicians, yeah. from our partner, from, um, but we actually, you got to ask that the, the um, Jack Nicholson question, can you handle the truth? You know? Yeah. But, yeah. And, and that's where a lot of people go, I, I actually can't handle the truth. I think I can, but I'm going to go right off my rocker if you tell me something that I don't want to hear that's against yes. what I want to happen in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on, on this note, I, um, I have a locals page and hopefully everybody's uh, following me there or considers it. But um, one of the things I do with the people on locals is I will bring up questions that they put in ahead of time. And at Sandy Paws, the uh, user brought this question up and it's kind of a, a loaded question. There's almost layers to this question. So we might have to chew on it a bit, but the question is, or statement, two questions. If discussion focuses on imminent physical threat, which we're kind of heading there, are there body language signs associated with the earlier stages of someone engaging in more subtle, long-term, and sustained psychological abuse, gaslighting, deliberate undermining around work colleagues, etc.? cetera? Mm. That is a loaded question because I think there's multiple parts there, but if she's really looking for, hey, are there indicators and warning signs that I should be seeing up front that could tell me that five years down the road, mm -hmm. the husband that I thought was perfect is actually an abuser? Yeah. Um, yeah, there are warning signs. There's... Um, gosh, you know, and, and I'll give just a, a quick example. Mm -hmm. If you are with someone and progressively, because I have a very dear friend who went through this, Mm -hmm. progressively, they're perfect, right? I mean, they're perfect on the outside. You think you're going to be a power couple. It's just everything is going great. And then all of a sudden you get together and you live together. Now you're living together and they start claiming space and territory and won't allow you to bring your personal objects or decorate or whatever. And it's uh, controlling that house environment. And then they're controlling what you do and how you do it in that environment. Beware beware because that's the tip of the iceberg because that's going to come into all that controlling behavior or any type of narcissistic behavior is going to have a domino effect it could even be that you're with you meet a guy and you both have families and you're with the guy and all of a sudden it's you know every time the holidays come it's going to his family his family his family and all of a sudden he's doing this to you and none of your friends can have you anymore none of your family members can come visit or you can't go on your own to visit family members 
that's a huge sign. That's a huge warning sign. And like Ellie said, we could talk for days about these signs. I mean, what to look for for any type of circumstances. But to answer her question, yes, they will appear. You just need to be aware of them. Ellie, do you have any examples? So I look at I look at the world through the lens of my five truth circles model. So I, any question that comes up, any experience in life, I, I say, how does that fit in with truth? And so so yes to everything Lena said, and I'd add to that, in a healthy relationship, in a robust relationship, in a loving relationship, in an outstanding relationship, which is what everyone says they want, uh, mm -hmm. which takes work. It, mm -hmm. Then truth is at the core of that. I, I'm able to sit down with you and say, hey babe. Um, there's something that's not doesn't feel right for me or there's something I'm not happy with or I'd like to talk to you about how we do this together or how this happens or how I'm feeling or whatever the case is, to be able to have that 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 safety, that comfort, mm -hmm. to be able to just talk truthfully and then something happens with it. Like, okay, yeah, I hear you. I didn't realise that was impacting on you. Um, okay, mm -hmm. what can we do about that? Do we need to get some counselling? Do we need to, you know, learn some more tools? If you can't sit down with your partner and really have truthful and authentic conversations, then your relationship probably needs some extra work to get to that deep connected stage. Just my map of the world. Yes, you can have a good relationship, but if you want something incredible and outstanding, then truth at a deeper level needs to come into it. So in that scenario, if she's tiptoeing around, she can't say this, she can't do this, you've got to watch out for this, got to be careful, you're afraid of this, um, that's warning bells all over the place, all over the place. Uh, you, you know, and try to be true. I, I want to talk to you about this. this your behaviour is is doing this to me. And if that is met with clash, clash, clash every time, I'd say, yeah, it, you can't do the work on it unless two people want to do the work. And if, yeah. if one person wants to do the work and the other person doesn't want to do the work and that's that, you, you're never, ever, ever going to get to that deep, connected, um, really, really special relationship in my view. And also, Eric, if you find yourself making up excuses for your partner's behavior, mm -hmm. that's that's going down the tubes fast because you yeah. should not have to make up an excuse for your partner's behavior at all. You're you're responsible for you. You're not responsible for their behaviors. You're responsible for your own. So if you're making up excuses to your friends, to your family, to yourself, that's mm -hmm. a huge warning sign. Okay, and this came in, and I think it's a on point with the from the chat these control freaks how much of it is conscious versus unconscious tendencies yeah i mean it could be personality it could be that that is their inherent personality from the get-go you just didn't know because when you met them you met their representative and they don't want to hide that why because the truth is a little too ugly and sometimes it can be developed over time with stress or other um I'm going to say outside elements, whether it's something to do with work or pressure for starting a family or, um, you know, losing money, blah, blah, blah. I, I do a lot of cases where in my training, I talk about husbands. Um, there's one particular case, this one guy who just he was out of work. He couldn't find a job. He was over two hundred thousand dollars in debt. His wife, they just had a little baby girl. He goes home and he shoots his wife and shoots the baby girl. And then he takes off to go back to London where his family is. It was insane, right? So what made this person who on the surface was, you know, um, lived in a big house and had a great family and was a lawyer at one point, what makes a person do that? Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't tell you, but does it happen? Yeah. Mm. One question about that, when you mentioned the controlling behavior and everything, I was thinking that that could be a victimizer that could also be potentially a victim Yes, that Absolutely. you have wound up in a relationship with. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. And the, the, the question around conscious and, and unconscious, uh, it could be a bit of both, but often that behaviour is coming from a much deeper place, yes. that it's layers mm -hmm. right, you, you backtrack it and you've got some something happening in the first seven years of someone's life that's already started to condition their, their behaviour mm -hmm. for later in life. So uh, people are behaving in a way that, they are getting fed what they need, whether that's feeding the ego um, or, or whatever it is. So a lot of it is unconscious in my view that that it's just this need that, and they don't know themselves well enough, comes back to truth, self-truth, which is the first of my five truth circles. Do you really know yourself? Do you really know how you show up in the world? Do you really know the impact that you have on other people? Are you happy with that? Are you happy that you piss most people off? Are you happy that you're in a crappy relationship? <laughs> 
you know, you know yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, as an early warning sign, and you guys can tell me if this is bad or good or whatever. One thing that I look for when I'm talking to somebody, especially women who are talking about their dating or whatever, is I will ask, how does he treat staff and waiters? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because often, and I could be wrong, it seems like, you know, of course, you're wooing your partner. But if they're very dismissive of anyone else around them, or if not a waiter, for example, they could be dismissive of them. Yeah. If they like to mock other people, that's something I, I'm curious about too. Like, and kind of get their partner in on. Yeah, look at look at this moron over here. I'm always wa waiting for the clock to tick and for the date to become that moron. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that am I off in that reasoning? What have you guys seen? No, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on. If that's tendencies and behaviors you're seeing to other people, my gut is at some point it's probably going to flip around and come back on me. Yeah. I, I think that uh, my summary of, of any of that sort of behavior, any, any behavior that is, is nasty to other people. I mm -hmm. see the way that I summarize that in my head is that that person is very, not very happy in their head, in their own space, in their own, mm -hmm. in their own head. Like even Eric, I'm sure that you would have sometimes you know comments on your on your um feed attack comments or oh criticize. no they love me everybody loves me it's just <laughs> nothing but <laughs> right, <pure. right. laughs> but when, you know all those people all those people that choose to spend a minute or two minutes or an hour writing nasty stuff on mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. what's going on in your head that that is okay like you're you're in there you're throwing stones these people are in the arena doing the work and doing the hard yards and getting out of the comfort zone, sitting up in the stands, throwing stones at them. Um, mm -hmm. What is wrong with that picture? You've got to have a look at yourself. If you're that person that writes those nasty, nasty things and, and criticise with someone online, hiding behind your screen, what's going on in your in your head, in your life? What's mm -hmm. your truth? Because you need to hold the mirror back up to yourself, in my view, because you're not in the arena. You're just throwing stones mm -hmm. at the people who are. Mm -hmm. so, and, so that would be the same as um the the person being nasty to the waiter like what what, what is it about you that makes you horrible to people what's going on yeah. for you um because you're not going to have a really sensational life with that sort of um mindset if you just yeah. speaking of great people dk me thank you very much that's the see that's a very kind comment that the super chat and donating to the show oh yeah. that is very kind Yay. <laughs> we, we celebrate all the good yeah. comments too. I'm like, there's a positive side too. Now, before we wrap up, I wanted to talk about you guys have um upcoming course or training, yeah. and I want to hear about it. I'm yeah. thinking that it, what we were just talking about may relate to it slightly. Uh, we yeah. are so so excited with the venture that Lena and I are. I have just just we're just birthing it now. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah it's, it's, <laughs> We're giving birth. It's called the Truth Love Academy is our overarching brand, the Truth Truth Love Academy. So essentially we're going to provide the most amazing resources for single women that are on mm -hmm. the dating scene looking for love. They want to stay safe. They want to hear about the signs and the body language. They want to improve themselves for themselves and they yeah. want to be able to cast their, their rod out and wind in their rod and, and land a great fish not just an average fish a great mm -hmm. fish to have a sensational relationship so we and also for women that are in relationships that want to to fine-tune what they're doing and tweak and get an even better result yeah. so we are pulling our our life experience our professional experience mm -hmm. and creating the most amazing resources nothing like this out there mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. truth, truth love academy there's a facebook page it's all very new but you can go there if you fit that criteria and join up now and be part of um, one of our founding members yeah oh cool are, are you guys going to do that in um what one methodology for creating a training course is you have the first group and they kind of get a better deal than everybody else because you're sort of saying you're the example and we're testing it out. And, um, you know, by being pioneers, you know, they're almost like examples in the future for everybody coming behind it. Are you guys exactly. doing something like that? Yeah. Yes. Yep. So yep. everybody should be looking up now. Is yeah. What you're saying. Get on board soon. <laughs> and yes. Very Truth Love Academy. Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> now, if they just want to, 
talk to you guys in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's lejohnson.com. Mm -hmm. And thank you for not doing AU and or. Uh, I always uh, go nuts with the uh, UK da da. You know, it, it's like the four <laughs> letters. It's like, please just buy the uh, dot com. <laughs> it's just so much easier. Uh, it's hard to get a dot com these days. It's really hard. Wow. wow. Yeah, but, uh, but dot co dot UK. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And then Lena. Yes. Is it lenacisco.com or congruencygroup.com? Yeah, you can go to my homepage, which is just lenacisco.com, and it will map you to my company page. And there's an email there too, but I'm way more interactive on my um, company page, which is thecongruencygroup.com. Okay, fantastic. Now, Lena's in and out of training all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe training a cop near you. So everybody be careful because uh, yeah. Lena's getting there. And folks, again, thank you so much. And if you guys like this kind of guest, you, you know what to do. Hit, please hit that button, that subscribe button. Mm -hmm. It will help me very, very much to keep Lena coming back. Or she'll say, dude, I'm, I'm over you. <laughs> no, you don't want me. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm bringing you new guests. Come on. Oh, there yeah, you go. Right. <laughs> thank you so much. Ellie, it's great meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric. It's been a pleasure.